Hello, my name is Gavin Simpson and I'm from the Institute of Environmental Change and Society at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan, Canada. Today I'd like to talk about estimating ecological resilience from poorly behaved time series. This is joint work with my undergraduate student Stefano Mezzini. <clears throat> big data, or at least biggish data, has become a feature of limnological research. Big data presents us with challenges, and through this talk today, I want to use a small data case study to highlight where as a field I think we are missing the opportunity afforded by big data because of the way we often approach analyzing our data. The mean. When we analyze data, we mostly focus on this property of our data set. There are other important properties of data, however, and in the short case study I want to talk about today, I'm going to look at the variance and how we can use statistical models to investigate changes in the variance of an ecosystem over time. The variance is an important measure of ecosystem state. Ecologists have linked variance with coexistence of populations, and variance can be interpreted in terms of resilience theory. Here I'm showing two cartoons. <clears throat> in, on the left, I'm showing the high resilience state, where the ecosystem returns rapidly to the equilibrium following perturbation, and hence has low variance, as shown in plot D. <clears throat> on the right, in the low resilience state, where the basin of attraction has become shallower, the ecosystem takes longer to return to equilibrium following perturbation, and, they, and it hence exhibits high variance. Estimating variance is, from time series is actually quite difficult, however. One way to estimate the variance of a series is by using a moving window approach. Here the analyst first detrends the time series, then chooses an appropriate window size, then, starting from the beginning of the series, calculates the variance of the observations in the window. Then we move the window along one time step, and then re repeat up at steps three and four until we get to the end of the time series. A trend in the resulting variance time series is estimated using Kendall's tower rank correlation. This whole approach is ad hoc, with many knobs to twiddle. How do you detrend the series? What width of window should be used? The method is ideally suited to regularly spaced data, so that you have the same number of observations in each window. But what about series with data gaps or missing observations, or data that are inherently irregularly spaced, as many environmental time series are? Statistical inference with this technique is also very hard. Kendall's tower assumes that the data are independent, but they can't possibly be because of the moving window and the dependent structure that, that, it, that it induces. Sometimes surrogate time series are, are used to assess the significance of the trend invariance. Surrogate time series are series generated with known properties that don't have a change in variance, but these approaches rely on classical techniques like armor models, which only work for regularly spaced data and the test is sensitive to the choice of order in the two parts of the armor. Today I want to illustrate how we can use modern statistical models to continuously estimate the variance of multivariate time series using data from Lake 227 in the Experimental Lakes area of Canada. The lake was experimentally manipulated to investigate responses to increased nutrients. The lake is annually laminated and my colleague Peter Levitt at the University of Regina has measured the subfossil pigment concentrations for each year between 1943 and 1990 when the core was taken. Kathy Cottenkamp, Jim Rusak and Peter Levitt previously analysed these data by separating them into a control period and a treated or experimentally manipulated period and compared the variances of the two periods using a Levine's test, which is the equivalent of a t-test but for differences of variances not means. They showed that the algal community was more variable in the treated period than in the pre-manipulation period. Today I will focus only on the main algal groups. Diatoms and chrysophytes through the pigment fucoxanthin, cryptophytes through allozanthin, cyanobacteria and chlorophytes through lutein zeaxanthin and theothytin B, and total algae through beta carotene. The challenge here is to estimate how the mean and the variance of the pigment community has changed continuously throughout the experimental manipulation. To do this, we'll need to need models for variance of a data set. If we think of the Gaussian distribution, that dis distribution has two parameters, the mean and the variance. In linear regression, we model the mean of the response at different values of the covariates, 
and assume the variance is constant at a value that we estimate from the residuals. In the left-hand panel, I'm showing how the Gaussian distribution changes as we alter the mean while keeping the variance fixed, while in the right panel, I keep the mean fixed but vary the variance. The parameters of this distribution are independent. Instead of treating the variance as a nuisance parameter, we could model both the variance and the mean as a function of the covariates. This is done using what is called a distributional model. In this model, we say that the response values yi, given the values of one or more covariates xi, follow some distribution d with parameters theta, which are themselves functions of one or more covariates. For the Gaussian distribution, theta1 would be the mean and theta2 the variance or standard deviation. We do not need to restrict ourselves to the Gaussian distribution, however. The gamma distribution would be more appropriate for describing the pigment data as it allows for positive continuous values where those values might be skewed with some large values. Here I'm showing different types of gamma distribution that vary in the mean and their variance. To estimate how the mean and the variance of the pigment data change during the experimental manipulation, I fitted a gamma distribution model using the VRMS package for R and the Stan Bayesian software. We assume the responses are conditionally distributed gamma, here g, and we model the mean and the shape parameter of the distribution with linear predictors, here written in the Greek letter eta. Each linear predictor includes a smooth function of year for each pigment. These smooth function functions are denoted by f. After fitting, we calculate the variance of each time point using the estimated values of the mean and the shape parameters, and we use the posterior distribution of the response to generate Bayesian credible intervals. Here are the results. This plot shows the estimated mean concentration for the five pigments estimated from the model, and which shows the increase in algal abundance during the experimental manipulation that was apparent in the data. More interestingly, here I'm showing a plot of the variances of the pigment time series over time that were estimated from our model. We clearly see the increased variance in the algal communities that Cottingham et al. observed, but now we can provide continuous estimates of the variance over time, rather than having to split the data into two and compare the variance of the two time series. This virtual summit is focused, in part, on the challenges and opportunities of big data in limnology. We've seen an explosion in big data products in limnology through projects like Gleon and Lagos, to name just two initiatives. While we have made progress on the big data side of things, we have made less progress as a field in how we analyze these big data once they've been collected or collated. In many respects, these are problems of small data too. Unless as a field we rethink the way we analyze big limnological data, we risk wasting the opportunity that these data afford us. Collectively, we need to think about how to effectively extract information from big data and how to do this using robust, defensible methods that are reproducible and repeatable. So how might we achieve this? The small case study I presented today speaks to many of the issues that I have with current data analytical practices. We should be using appropriate statistical models, not ad hoc metrics that make inference almost impossible for all but the ideal data set. We need to accept that most data sets we want to work with are not Gaussian and will not exhibit linear responses to or relationships with covariates. For example, data on extremes, such as lake minimum and maximum temperature time series, cannot possibly follow a Gaussian distribution. Time to event and duration data don't either. As an example, we could see Stefano's talk on trends in lake ice phenology from earlier in the session. And, as I hopefully showed here, trends or responses are often non-linear. We could use GAMs and smoothers instead of assuming that everything is linear. We want to avoid modeling each time series or site separately, instead take a hierarchical approach. This allows us to model how our data varies spatially, perhaps, and provides a means of summarizing and comparing all sites or series, rather than having to interrogate hundreds or possibly thousands of models post hoc, with little hope of doing valid inference, as we have hundreds of thousands of separate models. And finally, beware the allure of machine learning. Yes, they might seem appealing, but these methods need careful fitting and understanding of how they identify patterns. It's very easy to shoot yourself in the foot and produce incorrect results with these methods, which ultimately leads to poor science. In closing, I'd like to thank my colleague Peter Levitt at the University of Regina for the Lake 227 pigment data, 
and I'd like to thank the Faculty of Graduate Studies and Research and the NSERC Discovery Grants Programme for funding. The slides are available at the link and thank you for your attention.